The Primer, A Guide to the Truth by Jivan David Budu. This book is my gift to humanity, and as such will always be available free of charge to anyone willing to read it. Under no circumstances should any individual, group, or organization gain monetary profits from distributing this piece of literature. Chapter 2 how the universe's beginning functioned and why it had an effect on everything that took place after. At this stage in our evolution, many, if not most of you, have probably heard the famous phrase, the Big Bang Theory. But how many of you could describe it past? It describes the universe starting with a big explosion, right? Yes, this is the common take on how our everything came to be. And because of this maddening oversimplification, people's appreciation for how fundamental this is to our very existence is woefully empty. To gain this appreciation and understand why we exist today, we will break the entire process down through analogy and abstraction, just as we did to build space in the first chapter. To begin, imagine a piece of dark colored fabric. This is no ordinary fabric because this piece of material is unbreakable. Not only that, but it also snaps flat if you stop applying pressure to it. Weird, huh? The other cool thing about it is its ability to grow by absorbing more fabric, but you can only select the rate at which the fabric grows once, and the growth is applied evenly in all directions and locations not being touched. Sounds like something a superhero who is becoming Fatty McButterpants could use to make their costume, don't you think? Using a tiny piece of the fabric, I want you to stretch it out as much as you can by packing white sand into it. The fabric will wrap around the sand, shaping it into a super dense ball. Even though our fabric is unbreakable, you've packed so much sand into it, you can see it stressing under the immense pressure. Now that you have your dense ball of sand wrapped in our special fabric, we're going to begin the process of adding fabric to our stressed material. Pick a constant rate for our new material to be added. You don't need a rate in numbers. Just the idea that new fabric will be added throughout the material and every segment of it pretty evenly. Let's start the process and see what happens. The first thing you'll observe is the pressure of the sand on the fabric is so great, the new fabric you're adding is getting backed up like water behind the wall of a dam. This back pressure continues to build at an alarming rate due to the constant addition of new material. At some point, the pressure the sand is applying meets its limit and the added fabric violently overcomes it. This intense moment causes all of the backed up fabric to snap flat into the original tiny piece we started with almost instantly. In this instant of dramatic change, the fabric cracks like a wet towel being snapped into showers and flattens out as we initially described it would. This causes the dense ball of sand to shatter as it is pitched into the air, separating and flying in all directions above our ever-expanding fabric. After the backed-up fabric is fully absorbed into the flat growing sheet, its growth returns to the initial constant you had set it to, still growing, but at a considerably reduced pace. The sand falls down like a blanket of snow and covers the fabric pretty evenly in what looks like a layer of grainy frosting. And as our fabric continues to grow, the sand rides along the uniform expansion, slowly separating into smaller and smaller groups. Notice how in some areas, the clumps of sand are large enough to cause the fabric to sag under its pressure, and the material curves inwards. Imagine placing a bowling ball in the middle of a trampoline, and you'll get an accurate image of what I'm describing. Where these depressions start, any sand within the area that's curved is subject to that curve's influence and falls into the chasm, increasing its size. As the clump causing depressions grow really large, they gobble up much of the available free sand and many of the smaller clumps. Along the way, two of these giant depressions keep growing until their curves connect. From above, this looks like a figure eight. As each hungry depression grows, so does the connection between them, so much so, that the point where the curves first met starts to become depressed. This continues until the meeting point drops so low that the two clumps combine to create one colossal depression. As all of this is happening, the fabric has not stopped expanding. While the fabric cannot expand where the depressions are, anywhere not being curved by clump sand grows, creating greater and greater distances between the curved portions. 
Any free grains of sand ride the expanding material and become ever more lonely. What a crazy abstraction that was. And yet, if you give it some examination, it actually provides a solid place from which to start examining the Big Bang. As you may have guessed, the special fabric represents space slash the universe itself, while the sand represents the rippling particles of energy that build us all. This analogy is of course a two-dimensional imagining of space, as our peeled, bubbling surface sheet of water in the last chapter represented two-dimensional empty space. Before we go into deeper analysis, I must make it clear that we will never understand what the exact process was that gave birth to our universe. Nor will we ever know what happened or came before our universe, or what, if anything, exists outside its boundaries either. What we do know is that like our imaginary fabric, space has been expanding from as far back as we can observe, and this expansion appears to be constant. Through observing the movements of the largest structures in our universe, called galaxies, we have been able to calculate the trajectory of the expansion to find out how it grew along the way. For example, it is through such work that physicists calculated the universe as most likely extraordinarily flat, and not a giant ball as intuition might lead you to think. If it were not flat, it simply would not behave the way it does, nor look the way it does. I'm desperately avoiding the technical details simply because we would get bogged down and the entire chapter would be spent on this subject. Needless to say, it took a great many brilliant minds of our incredible species hundreds of years of observation, calculation, and experimentation to grant us this phenomenal knowledge that our ancestors never had access to. Such effort and knowledge is something worthy of our gratitude. Truly God's work of the highest order. And back to our analogy. As you can see, once the added material finally broke the pressure the sand was applying to the tiny piece of fabric we started with, the sand's trajectory became completely dependent on the expansion of our amazing material. Of all the aspects to this phenomenon, this single aspect is the most important, at least from our perspective. If we look at it another way, imagine humanity's foolishly favored device, the cell phone. Now take a piece of paper, tear it up into little pieces, and roll them into tiny balls. Place them on the screen with the phone on a flat surface and set it to vibrate. Ask someone to give you a call and observe. Would you say the paper has any input on what is happening to it, or are its trajectories at the mercy of the phone's influence? Exactly, the vibrating phone has complete determination on the destiny of the paper balls. In the same way, the sand's destiny is completely at the mercy of the expanding fabric. Let's say we started the analogy back to where our tiny piece of fabric is packed with the dense ball of sand. Only this time, you're going to change the rate the new fabric is added by doubling the speed. Let's start the process and see what effect the increased rate of expansion has on the same amount of sand. As we saw in the first simulation, the fabric backs up as it builds to overtake the pressure of the sand. In only half the amount of time, the added fabric pops the pressure and snaps flat, throwing all of the sand into the air as the material expands below it. And just like the first one, after the backed up material is quickly absorbed, it returns to expanding at the pace we initially set. Where things differ is the fabric has grown larger than it was during the first simulation when the sand falls onto it. Due to the doubled rate of expansion, clumps are now struggling to gain enough sand to generate large enough depressions to collect more sand. What's more, the grains outside of any depressed curved fabric, flat areas, are being isolated from its fellows quicker. In this simulation, there isn't enough time for any large depressions to combine. Instead, we see a bunch of small clumps and a lot more isolated grains singing, One is the loneliest number. If we ran a third simulation where the speed of expansion is half the first and four times slower than the second, we would see the breaking of the dense ball pressure taking much longer. Once it happens, the fallen sand would form large clumps rapidly and they would be combining in high numbers. The amount of available flat fabric the new fabric could expand into would be much less than either of our other simulations. There is also so much curved fabric, the amount of free grains of sand is also minuscule by comparison. So what can we surmise from these three simulations we abstracted? Without a question, 
The rate at which the fabric expands is what determines the fate of the sand, just as we saw with the cell phone vibrating balls of paper. This is the most fundamental variable of why our universe looks the way it does. To bring everything full circle, let's bring our abstraction from chapter 1 back with our cube of rippling empty space, including the Higgs mass time gravity field. Start by flicking energy into the cube. Flick every field and don't stop. You should see the flicked particle energy having less and less space to move around. And since the Higgs field has to move inwards to interact with the particles to give them mass, the entire cube begins to collapse in on itself. Once the collapse starts, the field's boundaries that distinguish each particle also break down, and our once cube-shaped little universe is now locked. When space reaches this state, we call it a singularity. Time does not function in a singularity because the fields of space have broken down and the Higgs field is locked in place. There are untold trillions of these singularities in our universe, and we call them black holes, due to the fact that particle energy, including light, does not escape the space pushing in on the dense mass at the center, and to our eyes, it looks empty. Now that we have our embryonic singularity we created with our once perfect space cube, we're going to apply the same abstraction we did with the fabric and sand. New space constructed of all three dimensions and the Higgs field will be added to our singularity, and this new space will be added evenly to every section of our deformed cube. Gentlemen, start your engines. As you saw with our fabric sand analogy, it takes a buildup of new space to break the pressure of the space locked into the particle energy. And like the fabric sand analogy, once that pressure meets its breaking point, there is a massive inflation as the built up space is rapidly absorbed into the cube we started with. This period of inflation represents the proposed and leading hypothesis that describes how our universe blossomed into being. Physicists analogize this inflation to a pebble inflating to the size of the Earth in 0.000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
things finally calm slash cool down enough for the particles to settle into the fields that build space. When this finally happens, atoms, as described in chapter 1, naturally form. Each atom is a far more massive packet of energy than a particle, and as more of them form, regions of space that contain even slightly greater densities of atoms cause space to start interacting with those regions more than less dense regions. As we discussed in chapter 1, this phenomenon is what we call gravity. Before we get to the amazing things that come next, there are a few basic principles about our universe we have to acknowledge first. 1. Energy cannot be created or destroyed within our universe. It can only be converted from one form to another. 2. Newton's Third Law. For every interaction, there is an equal and opposite reaction. 3. The momentum of a free-moving object is conserved even when the directional angle is changed. This only changes if the object's energy is absorbed or reflected by contact with another object. So as atoms now begin to dominate our universe's landscape, continuously bouncing off of each other, and areas of space become more populated with them, space itself, through Higgs interactions, begins pushing in on those regions. Because there is so much available energy in the form of atoms, hydrogen in the case of our universe, space continues to push in on these atom-dense regions. Despite the extreme uniformity of energy when we look at our universe on a large scale, on small scales the slightest divergence from that evenness causes directional momentum to be conserved. This momentum results in the atoms and the space pushing them towards the center of the density to rotate. As the amount of space moving inwards encourages more atoms towards the dense mass, most of the atoms arriving to join the party begin orbiting the central density with gravity acting as the guide. More on this in a bit. This process is a very slow one from a human perspective. The first stars didn't appear in our universe until roughly 200 million to 300 million years after the Big Bang set everything off. So mothers complaining about nine months get some perspective. Just kidding, Mom. You're probably wondering when a star is finally considered born. That happens when the amount of energy space pushes together achieves enough density near the center that the pressure causes two hydrogen atoms to fuse their proton and neutron nuclei to form a stable larger atom called helium. Each time this fusion occurs between two atoms of any kind, a photon of energy is released. This is how stars form and why they emit light radiation that eventually allowed for our planetary life to develop. To slow things down, let's compare our universe analogy to our fabric sand analogy. Both function in the same basic way. A medium within slash upon lies all of the energy of that system. What determines the trajectory and the fate of that energy is at the mercy of the medium's expansion from the very beginning. Both show that any uneven density of energy or sand causes a change in how the medium behaves if that energy or sand were not present. If the amount of energy in that region is great enough, the medium will continue to push or curve energy slash sand towards the center mass. This is how all large objects in the universe are formed, including stars, planets, moons, asteroids, large rocky bodies, and even some early black holes. The next stage in our universe's evolution involves the larger of the stars within it. Today, most of the stars in our universe are roughly the size of our sun or smaller. In the earliest stages of stellar development, the availability of much more dense amounts of energies would have produced massive stars, anywhere from 1.4 times to 10 plus times more massive than our sun. These giants and the gravity that produced them caused them to fuse atoms at incredible rates. And as the old saying goes, a candle that burns twice as bright lives half as long. All stars fuse atoms they've produced. They generally start with mostly hydrogen and less than a third helium, which are fused together to form more massive atoms. How far it gets in this progression depends on how much particle energy gravity was able to squeeze together before the fusion process started, because this determines how much pressure space will generate. Any star 1.4 times the mass of the Sun or greater will progress fusing through the periodic table of elements until it gets to iron. 
Once a star gets to the point of producing large quantities of iron, the mass of the atoms being forced to the center, or core of the star, make the density so high, the amount of space required to interact with it exceeds what keeps the star's structure as it is. First, the star swells as the pressure of gravity begins a major push towards the center, and then, in one violent event, space collapses in on the core. All of the energy outside the star's core is blasted away due to the negative pressure created by space violently moving towards the center mass. Think of it as a void that causes energy to spread and find its lowest energy state, or the freest region of space that is available. In other words, entropy takes its course. This entire process is called a supernova, and while being the most powerful energetic event that occurs in our universe, post-Big Bang, it is also one of the most beautiful. The nebula, or cloud of star particles, or dust, that is blasted away, contains all of the more massive atoms that form rocky planets like ours, and all of the life on our planet. This is why you may have heard that you're made of stardust slash material. The reason this happens is that as space collapses in on the core, fusion goes into overdrive due to the extreme pressure, and atoms slash elements that a star wouldn't produce under typical conditions are created. The process also does something to the atoms being squeezed into the core. Space basically pushes in all the most massive particles, those being quarks and gluons that make up the nuclei of every atom, and all of the less massive particles are pushed out with the rest of the star's mass. The remaining core is either one of two things, a neutron star, or, if there is enough energy, a black hole. A neutron star is a stellar object made of only neutrons, since they are more massive than protons. A black hole is the same except the pressure of space is so strong, it prevents anything from escaping, as photons do from a star. In a black hole, as mentioned before, the boundaries that separate the fields of space also break down, and time no longer functions. Why am I explaining all of this to you, you might be thinking? Only to give you a full appreciation of the processes that led to the creation of not just yourself, but everything you hold dear. Back to our nebula of stardust. Because stars large enough to go supernova eject such large amounts of energy, within these clouds, new smaller stars form. Remember when I described that as stars form, the momentum of the atoms joining the formation is conserved, causing gravity to rotate as well? Well, this rotational momentum, once large enough, causes all of the gas within the reach of that gravity well to join the orbital dance. To ensure there's no confusion, picture a stick with a string tied to its middle, and on the other end of the string is a ball. Now grab the stick and start making circles with it. The faster you go, the more the ball and string end up rotating in the opposite direction that the stick is pointing. In other words, the string and ball orbits perpendicular to the axis of the stick, but in line with the energy being applied. This is why rotational energy causes objects to flatten as you increase the rate of spin. We've all seen, or most have seen, someone working pizza dough. Really skilled makers can throw the dough into the air while applying spin not only to flatten it out, but to distribute the dough evenly across the total body, forming an even disc. In the same way, you can draw an imaginary line through the north and south poles of a forming star and see where the disk of energy will form. And these star-forming disks are enormous. When our sun was forming, the disk would have been roughly two light years, 19 trillion kilometers across. If you had an imaginary highway that long and your car never needed refueling, traveling at 100 kilometers an hour, 62.5 miles per hour, it would take you over 20 million years to cross it. And that's just the diameter of our solar system. As these disks gradually form, not all of the energy orbiting the central mass ends up in the star. Just as the star formed with atoms being pushed together by gravity, the remaining disk energy will start forming their own disks that follow the orbit of the disk it is born from. As these bodies gather more atoms and bonded groups of atoms we call molecules, Sometimes, more than one body forms in the same orbital path, and collisions occur. It is from these star-forming disks, and the same process that causes stars to form, 
that planets and moons form. Not only that, but the makeup of the planets and moons are entirely dependent on how massive the star was that went supernova before them, because that determines the types and quantities of the atoms and molecules that will be available during their formations. As promised, these first two chapters contain quite a lot of data and knowledge to take in. I've done my best to keep the technical aspects of it all to a minimum, but I'm fully aware of the sheer breadth it all encompasses. However, this knowledge is absolutely necessary to get an accurate perspective of our place in the universe and how we came to exist. After these two chapters, things become far more relatable as we'll be focusing on our planetary womb, Earth, and the life that formed on it. But before we get there, it is important to do a point form recap of what you've learned so far. 1. Through the bowl of water abstraction, we learn that space is not empty when we see nothing with our eyes. Space is a medium that has an inherent energy bubbling within it in three dimensions. 2. Every particle that builds us and everything we see and interact with is made of excited space. This means we are made of bonded excited space. In other words, we are made of the universe itself. 3. Space slash the universe is built of many fields, each with its own distinct properties that distinguish it from the others. These fields never cross boundaries unless you have a singularity or black hole. 4. Atoms are a collection of fields that form specific configurations. The most abundant atom is hydrogen, which stars are mostly made of. 5. One field of space called the Higgs field plays a very important role in creating mass, time, and gravity. If the Higgs field interacts with a particle of another field, that particle will have mass, experience time, and produce gravity, all because the Higgs field causes space to interact with itself. Any field that does not interact with the Higgs will be massless, not experience time, produce no gravity, and move at the maximum speed the universe allows, 300,000 kilometers per second. 6. Time is the imprint left on space when the universe interacts with itself through the Higgs field. The more particle energy present in a given region of space, the slower time is imprinted. The effect is constant, but incredibly small until you get to very large densities of particle energy. 7. Gravity is a measure of space moving towards a central mass to interact with it. The more particle energy in a given region of space, the more space is required to interact with it from outside the boundaries of the particles in question. 8. If the density of particle energy is high enough, space will collapse in on that energy, stopping time and locking that space in a strong gravitational curvature called a singularity. 9. Our universe started as a singularity where all of the energy we measure and see in it today was all locked into a very small amount of space. 10. The birth of the universe, or Big Bang, started when space was being added to the singularity causing it to rupture, dispersing all of the energy throughout an eternally expanding universe. 11. Through the fabric and sand analogy, we saw that the dominant force of a medium determines the outcome of anything riding on top slash within it. The fate of the particle energy in our universe was and continues to be determined by the nature and variables associated with the initial and continued rate of expansion. 12. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, only converted from one form to another. 13. Every interaction causes an equal and opposite reaction. 14. Angular momentum is conserved unless the energy is absorbed or converted into another form. 15. Through all of the above, we see that stars are a natural consequence of the amount of particle energy available in a given region of space. They ultimately come into being because space pushing on the energy grouped at the center creates a well around its boundaries, causing more energy to be pushed into the central mass. 16. A star is born once the pressure of space slash gravity squeezes hydrogen atoms so hard they fuse together to form a more massive atom called helium. Each time this happens, a massless particle called a photon, light, is released. 17. If the star is massive enough, gravity will cause the star to keep fusing more massive atoms together. 
If a star gets to the point of producing lots of iron through the fusion process, space collapses in on the core, blasting away the outer shell into space in what we call a supernova. 18. The core left behind is then either a neutron star or a black hole. 19. The discarded outer shell creates an enormous cloud of stardust we call a nebula. 20. From these nebulae, new stars form. 21. Within the disk of energy feeding newly forming stars, the excess material forms the planets and moons of any solar system. 22. The makeup of these bodies orbiting stars is entirely dependent on how massive the star that went supernova before it was. Holy crickets, all of that in two chapters. Lucky you, because it took me reading books, research papers, and articles decades to be able to condense all of that knowledge into those two chapters. And now we get to the most important five words you'll read in this book. The stimulus dictates the response. I call this the most important word equation humanity needs to understand. We can debate whether the universe is an electromagnetic one, or how many fields of space there are, or even if some of the established standard models of physics are correct. All of that being the case, this word equation still applies to the foundational function of energy interacting with other energy. Everything in our universe operates on this principle. A stimulus triggers a response. That response becomes a stimulus, which triggers a response of something else. And repeat. If you're looking for infinity, you don't have to look much further than this equation. So what was the initial stimulus that kicked off the equation in our universe? You guessed it. The expansion of the universe itself. In that incredibly infinitesimal fraction of a second, the rate at which the universe inflated and then continued to expand dictated what would happen to the energy residing as part of it. Energy down to the particle level does not act with conscious intent. It simply moves through space until it receives a stimulus and provides one to that which it interacted with. And through an insurmountable number of the stimulus-response equation interactions across the never-ending expansion of space, our sun, planet, moon, and as you'll see, all life on our planet, was granted existence. It took roughly 10 billion years until the building blocks of life formed the first cell that would seed all life on our beautiful Earth. And to this current day, you and everything you're made of, and everything around you, and everything it took to get to the point of you reading this book, from the very beginning of the universe until its eventual end, if it will have one, has operated on this function of the stimulus dictating the response and repeat. I hope that gives you some sense of perspective. Because from here on, our focus will be on life and why it is so special amongst the universe's bountiful creations.